there's no telling how many songs the saints have sung through the centuries that we don't know but are blessed nonetheless and uh, to be honest with you I think that's going to be a major part of our heavenly uh, life is to praise and worship and honor and glorify God and we're all going to be on key and we're all going to know the words and uh, I think that's going to be a great time. Let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 22. When I read this psalm, I couldn't help but think about, because all the dynamics that you'll be seeing as we go through this particular uh, chapter in Psalms and how it connects throughout the scriptures, I thought of one of my favorite hymns, and it's I Love to Tell the Story. And what we're going to be looking at this morning is not going to be a surprise or a great revelation to any of us who are here, because it's the gospel story that we all know. It's the one that is not, uh, there won't be any great revelations that you've never heard of before from me. But I do believe that you are going to enjoy this message because of what it points to and what it means for us individually. It's personal. This psalm is very personal because it is between us and God individually. It isn't a philosophical pontification from a preacher. I, I worked on that sentence, by the way. I, I liked it because it, people just go, okay, whatever. But I do know that believers never tire of hearing the story of Jesus and the salvation that he brought to us through the cross. And we all know that the Psalms, as a compendium of songs that are sung, <coughs> They are written for God's people to encounter him in the midst of our life events. I have found that as I have gotten older, the Psalms mean more to me. And in fact, all the saints that I have talked to over the years say the same thing, that the older they get, the more the Psalms are understood. Psalms is also the most quoted book in the New Testament. And Psalm 22 is a story, uh, actually it's a narrative, a story I, th I think of something that could or could not be true, but Psalm 22 is triply true. When David wrote this psalm, it was true for him in the life that he was going through. You are going to see that uh, it was very true for Jesus. And even today, this psalm is true for us. After the Lord's Supper, Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray. And here's what's recorded. Just listen. From Luke 22 and verse 39, here's what we find. And he, talking about Jesus, and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Scripture is given for our help in hard times. And so one of the things that I hope that you get from our time together each week is that we should go to the Scripture when we are in stressful life situations. And Jesus did this often. That's what we find, as was his custom. A few comments from Luke 22 I want us to consider before we actually go to Psalm 22. The first one is that prayer is a constant and focused conversation with God. That was the whole point of last Sunday's message, pretty much. The phrase, as was his custom, Jesus going to the 
Garden of Gethsemane, lets us know that Jesus prayed often. And when he was in Jerusalem, most likely he went and prayed in the garden. Now, I've got to, I've got to tell you, I, I, I went back in my memory and remembered when I went to the Holy Land. And the Garden of Gethsemane was my second favorite site to see. There was one olive tree there in the midst of it. It was hardened off so that we could not touch it or anything like that. But they said it was close to 2,000 years old, which means that it was a little budding sprout when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But again, I said the Garden of Gethsemane was my second favorite site to go. And I'll be honest with you, it was, it was an emotional time for me because they you go into the Church of All Nations, which is right beside the Garden of Gethsemane, and they have a little um, place that is, is protected. And traditionally, that was where Jesus prayed. And I, I had to quit filming with my little camera because I was shaking so much. But my first favorite place to go in Jerusalem was, can you guess it, Pam and Mom? No. Can you guess what it is? The Mount of Olives. And the reason is because that's where he ascended and that's where he's coming back. Jesus prayed to the Father, remove this cup from me. And this shows us the human side of Jesus. Now, guys, we may have stress and problems, difficulties, anxiety, work, home, wherever it may be. But what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, stressed in the garden is things that we will never experience or understand. One commentator describes the time when he sweat like great drops of blood this way. And I think I've mentioned this before. That while Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, apart from Peter, James, and John, and apart from the apostles, God took Jesus to the edge of the pit of hell. Jesus saw what God's eternal wrath and damnation for sinners is. Then, just a stone's throw away, he could look back and see the apostles sleeping. Jesus looks at hell, then he looks at the apostles sleeping, and God says, it's either you or them. When it comes to eternal damnation, it's one of the two. It's either you or it's them. Jesus chose God's will because of his love for the Father and for us. Jesus healed the blind and lame. He cast out demons. He raised the dead to life. He walked on water, fed 10,000, and never broke a sweat. He was able to do miraculous things. And it was through his words, sometimes his touch, that it would take place. The only time it is recorded in Scripture that Jesus broke a sweat was when he prayed. In his humanity, Jesus did not want to go through God's eternal wrath. But he loved the apostles and us more than he loved himself. He chose the cross because of his love for God the Father first and for those he came to save. In fact, in Luke 19, 12, Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. That's us. So in order for Jesus to save the lost, he had to endure God's... Slow down here. Every time I come to this concept, this idea, this truth, I am absolutely overwhelmed and I don't get it. But Jesus knew that he had to endure the eternal wrath of God 
focused into three hours for every single person who would believe. Try to let that sit in on you. Jesus endured God's eternal damnation and wrath for every person in this room. So there are multiple eternities that Jesus endured from the wrath of God for each believer here today. But not only those of us who are here, but every believer alive today. But not only them, every believer who has ever lived. God took his eternal wrath for all of that and focused it down into three hours and put it on Jesus. I can't fathom that. I cannot fathom that. Either Jesus pays or we pay one of the two. That, that's why I think we need to stop and in our times of singing and praise and worship and prayer that we need to really try as best as our puny little human minds and souls and spirits can is to understand, embrace exactly what it costs Jesus and God in order for us to be saved. I don't think we can do that. Try as we might, we cannot get to fully embrace what it costs Jesus and the amount of love that it take, took for him to, 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 to purchase us from the pits of eternal damnation and hell. Either Jesus pays or we pay for our sin by eternity. And again, I just want to bring up that Jesus experienced all of God's wrath on the cross for every single person who would believe. Now you're in Psalm 22. And I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There, there's a part of me that wants to read through the whole chapter. Because it is, just, it is just packed full of the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. Jesus cries out. Actually, David's words that were written centuries before. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to emphasize, put an underline under the word me. Why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning put it in your mind this way it's like he's saying dad dad don't you realize that that this is me i'm your son and, and why is it you're turning your back on me now he is experiencing this in the humanity and i want to suggest to you i, I have a different view of the interaction between God the Father and God the Son. I do not think that God turned his back on Jesus at the cross. I've heard preachers say that over and over and over. I think that when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? And the words of my groaning, Daddy, it's me. I think God said, Son, I know. I know it's you. I want you to understand that this is not easy for me either. I'm going to tell you something. When, when one of our children is hurting, it hurts me. If I can do anything to stop their pain, guess what? I'll do it. I can't imagine God the Father choosing to look upon His Son and the, and the difficulty and the pain and the agony that he was inflicting on him in order for us to be saved and doing that in such a manner we can't even comprehend. I believe that God looked at what Jesus endured on the cross 
And he said, I'll accept that in order for them to be forgiven. See, God does not just forgive anyone. God's forgiveness comes at the price of the death and the wrath of God upon Christ. That, that's why when it comes to, when, when, when we really begin to grasp and understand and embrace what it took to save us, it will not do anything but humble us. Because God chose, God chose to save us. And we respond to the love of God and the love of Christ. And that's how we're saved. But that's not all that happened on the cross. Yes, Jesus took on God's wrath, his eternal wrath for each believer. And in so doing... We are not just forgiven because now I want you to hear me on this. A forgiven sinner is still a sinner. And a sinner cannot go into the presence of God. What happened is that Jesus paid for our sin and we're forgiven. But there's another element that took place. And I, I'm going to say it's a step up. A step further is that we have Christ's righteous perfection imputed to us. Now, what that means is it was placed upon us. So it's not that we're just forgiven, but we are given the righteousness of Christ to be able to enter into the presence of God. And that's what Psalm 22 is telling us all about. Even in the midst of what he knew was coming and when he was on the cross, as horrible and, and, and difficult as it was, he never turned away from God. I can't tell you the number of people over the years that tell me that God put my granny or my mom or my baby or whoever through such difficulty and hardship and pain because of a physical ailment. And they say, I will never worship a God like that. And I've, <laughs> I wish I had thought more to say, do you not understand that God knows that better than you ever can? He took his own son and imputed to him our sin, punished him for our sin so that we could be saved. You want to talk about the love of God? then forget about your granny, forget about your children, forget about all these other things, and make it personal for yourself. What God and Jesus did because they loved you and gives you the opportunity to be saved, your sins forgiven, and you choose to turn away from that, does not make any sense whatsoever. That's why people deserve hell. Because they look at the cross of Jesus Christ and the love of God and they say, I don't care. And anybody that says that about Christ and his death and penalty, taking on God's penalty for sin at the cross, they deserve eternal damnation. And you know what I like about the gospel? Whosoever will may come. But when people turn their back on Christ and what he did and what God did, they deserve eternal damnation. But Jesus still sought God. And that's a great lesson for us. As Jesus felt ab abandoned, God had a plan and was in control. It's the same for us. Please listen to me at this. I do not care what you go through for the rest of your life or what you have gone through. If you are a child of God, he has a plan that is for your, our ultimate good, whatever happens. Whatever happens, what is it uh, God, Job said, God gives, God takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so when it comes to the difficulties of our life, it's not like it's something that God has not experienced himself. His son has experienced. And we can trust God that he loves us enough to do whatever it takes for us to be saved, to be with him in glory, to be forgiven of our sin, and to be part of his family. Praise God for that. 
I mean, that right there should be enough for us to be able to handle and know and understand. That's why I point to the cross so much. If you ever wonder whether or not God loves you, look at the cross. That is the, the pen ultimate proof of the love of God. And everything else falls under that. God has a purpose for our plan. It's for his glory and our good. Tim Keller, who is now with the Lord, made, it, made this statement about prayer, which that's what, that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was praying, talking to God. And here, here's what he defined prayer is. In prayer, God gives us everything we would have asked for if we knew everything he knows. That's the Holy Spirit interceding for us too deep for words. Because life is hard, especially for us as Christians, but God has a plan. And he doesn't have a plan B. Understand that. God does not have a plan B. There is a plan. And he is working it out, and it will be carried out for his glory and always for our good. He has already promised never to leave nor forsake us. You remember that? Jesus will never leave me. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he is not present. Nor does it mean that he is not at work to bring about his glory and will. Just because we don't see or understand God's plan does not mean he does not love us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by what? Faith. faith, not by sight. And see, sooner or later, we'll go through hardship, we'll experience difficulty, and it's okay, and it's biblical, to take our pain and uncertainty to God as Jesus and David did in Psalm 22. As long as we trust God in the moment and for the future, which includes eternity. Now, what I just said is what Jesus did in Gethsemane and on the cross. So again, I encourage us to read and know the scripture because through them, we will know and understand God better. Not only that, he will comfort and grant us his ultimate peace through our obedience. Now, Psalm 22, there's so much. Um, look, look at verse three. This is something about worship here. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In other words, his people. When we praise and sing our, our worship to God, there is a, a supernatural interaction and presence of God in our praise. We know that we're two, three or more. Two or more? Three or more. How many is it? Two or more. Okay, two. That he is in our midst. But imagine when we are singing and praising God, from the heart, there is a special uh, interaction between the spirit world and us where it says we are in, he is enthroned on the praises of Israel. Look down at verse 8, uh, excuse me, verse 6, where Jesus is, I mean, th there's so much of Psalm 22 that, that, is, that is right to the cross. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, which is what they did at the cross. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in God. That, again, were some words that Jesus quoted on the cross. And then you see, we go back into verse 9 where he's praying to God, where he took me from the womb and made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast forth from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there are none to help. In verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in this dust of death. 
verse 17. I can count all my bones, and they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you officers. Imagine being on the cross and thinking through this. That's what we are to do when we're in hardship and difficulty, is to be praying this kind of prayer back to God. Go down to verse 27. It says, All the ends of the earth shall turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. That goes even to the future yet for us. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Even one who could not keep himself alive, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told to the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. And there's where he's praying for us, that he has done it. In Psalm 22, verse 7, Jesus had these thoughts on the cross. Everybody who sees me mocks me. They make mouths at me. You ever seen people walking by there? Just, you can tell they're saying something. They're just You can't hear it, but, but it's there. And it, This is just a, a description of, of, I mean, and in verse eight, I mean, I can't imagine the how horrible it must be. You know, he trusts in God. Let him deliver him. They said that. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I mean, that was just an insult upon insult upon insult upon insult that Jesus had while on the cross. And then he says, "I'm poured out like water." In verse fourteen, his bones are out of joint. Talking about his shoulders and his legs. His heart was like wax. If you remember, when they pierced his side, water flowed. His strength was dried up. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You remember that he, he said, I'm thirsty. And they, they started, they put some hyssop in a, in a concoction and offered it to him, which was really alcohol. It was a, a strong wine that was given to people who were dying. And Jesus turned away from that because he, God, how could he do this? He wanted to, he wanted to, he did not want to be, to one bit of God's wrath to be taken away because that would have meant somebody else had to go through it. And Jesus did it himself. In verse 25, for you comes my praise. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. That points to the, to the uh, consequence of the cross. That points to what we have because of Christ. And, and David prophesied about Jesus' uh, crucifixion, the events and its, and its success. And that's what verse 26 is all about. And if you go back to Matthew 27, all those things took place that David foretold. The casting of his lots, of lots for clothes, mocking him, physical beatings. But in the midst of it all, Jesus sought God. And on the cross, God answered Jesus' prayer. He said, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Jesus finished that out by saying, nevertheless, not mine, but yours. I believe that on the cross, God didn't turn his back on Christ, but I think that what God did is he saw what his son was going through and paying the penalty of our sin, and I think God said, yes, I will accept that as payment for, the, for those who believe that they may be clothed with the righteousness of my son and given eternal salvation. I don't think God turned his back on him. I think that it seemed that way to Jesus. 
just like it does to us when we're having trials, hardship, difficulty, problems, all those kind of things. And God does not immediately swoop in like Mighty Mouse, Superman, Batman, whatever you want to talk about, and save the day. We wonder, where are you? And God has never abandoned us. He says, I will never leave nor forsake you. And we have to believe him and trust in him. Just like Jesus. And the thing about it is, is, you know, guys, the older I get, two things ha are happening to me. The older I get, the faster time goes. The older I get, the more I'm looking forward to heaven. And I mean looking forward to heaven. You know, I don't do it every time, but I, a lot of mornings when I wake up and I look to the east, I think one day, not far off. If you'll notice, a lot of of cemeteries have their uh, gravestones looking east. I think we do out here, don't we? You know why, you know why that is? It's because that's, that's how we've always been taught. That's where Jesus is coming back. We're not looking west, we're looking to the east. And so, yes, we, we read Psalm 22, and it's hard, and it's difficult, and we read about the crucifixion of Jesus, and you think of how brutal it could be. But, but I want you to think about something. There were two people that were saved at the cross during Jesus' crucifixion. One of them was before he died. Who was that? The thief on the cross. Remember me when you enter uh, your kingdom, when you go into paradise. The guy was a reprobate. The guy was a thief. People hated him. Not but just a few moments to hours earlier, he too cursed Christ with the other thief on the cross. But then he said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus said, when? Today you will be with me in paradise. And then it was not long after that that Jesus died. You know who the first person was that I believe came to salvation after the death of Jesus. The Roman centurion. What, what was it he said? Truly, this man was the Son of God. That's a statement of faith and belief. It's interesting to me that there weren't two Jews that came to Christ. It was two Gentiles and two pe people that were just reprobates. And then there's us. I can remember, I can remember the day when God literally intervened into my life, riding bicycles behind the house, and a good friend at the time asked me, pulled me over. We were riding bicycles, he pulled me over. He said, if you died, you're going to heaven or hell. I never thought about that before, but hell was something I knew about. And uh, going home, went in the back door, mom, Asked me why I was crying. I told her. We went up to my bedroom. I can still remember every bit of it just as clear. I've even got the Bible at home in one of the bedrooms that uh, she turned to John 3.16 and read to me. And um, here's the interesting part. She prayed. I didn't. But I knew God saved me. Which means in my little world, you don't have to pray to be saved. God saves you. And then you'll pray. That's just how I believe it happened. But guys, take some time today, this afternoon, and, and go read Psalm 22 slow. And just kind of embrace what it took to save you. You, not your family, not your kids or grandkids, but you. And then imagine what it was like for him to save everyone on the cross. And then, last idea, that we are to be holy as he is holy. We are to live a life that does not impugn the name of Christ or our God. And we should share the gospel with people who do not know Christ because otherwise they will be eternally separated from them. You know, you really have to hate somebody to know they're lost and not share Jesus. But then we have Jesus. And we can go to him any time, night or day, in any situation. And that, brothers and sisters, is a dear gift from our Father. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you.
and have just barely, barely, barely scratched the surface of when your son was on the cross to save us and what it must have been like for you and for the Holy Spirit and your son when that took place. We cannot fathom it. But what we do know is that you, by your Holy Spirit, come and open our hearts and our minds that we may embrace and understand and believe in your Son and in you. And so, God, help us that we may take the Christian life seriously, that we may live in a manner that honors and glorifies you, so that whatever we do in word or deed brings glory to your name. For it's in his name we pray for your glory. Amen. Joel? 149.